Well, good morning, church. Danielle and Mark and I, Victor. we are just delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very good and a blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. And of course, this week's lesson, and by the way, this is the 12th lesson of the quarter already. It is titled, Joseph, Prince of Egypt. The memory verse is found in Genesis chapter 41, verses 41. And it says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. So what that verse is really saying to us is that Joseph is appointed viceroy over all Egypt. And the viceroy is a governor. And in the case of Joseph, he wasn't governing a province or a colony. He was governing the country. So now... Um, let me give you a little brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. So this week's Sabbath School lesson comes from Genesis chapter 41 to 45. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark to uh, lead us to the throne of grace. Um, let's ask for God's blessings. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, that'd be for sure. Um, dear Lord, we're about to dig into... Uh, an incredible story, and a story where we people overcome being hurt, um, forgiveness, trust, all the things, things that we know that we each have to work on. Help us to dig into this story, learn about it, and really come out of here understanding that message that you want each of us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mark. So then this week's uh, Sabbath School lesson comes from Genesis chapters 41 to 45. These chapters described Joseph's amazing rise to become viceroy over all Egypt and his dealings with his brothers when they come to Egypt to buy some grain, to, go, to buy some food. In chapter 41, we see Joseph explaining to Pharaoh the meaning of his dreams, Pharaoh's dreams which concerns the future political and economic problem of the country of Egypt. And we see him also provide Pharaoh, and I'm talking about Joseph providing Pharaoh, with the solution to these problems. You see, it is important to note that Joseph is not merely satisfied just to reveal God's plans, nor is he passive, waiting for God to perform another miracle. No, in Genesis chapters 41, 33, um, we, re, we, we see that Joseph suggests to Pharaoh that he appoints a discerning and wise man. Let's read that verse, verses 33 of chapter 41. Here's what the verse says. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt to manage the complex operation of preparing for the famine. With this counsel, Joseph demonstrates significant wisdom and virtue, a wisdom and virtue that emanates from a faithful and totally dependent relationship with God. You see, wisdom is knowing what to do next. Virtue is doing it. And so Pharaoh appoints Joseph viceroy over all Egypt. Well, 20 years later, 20 years after getting rid of Joseph, his brothers journey into Egypt to buy grain because of a severe regional drought and famine. As they come into Egypt, they are confronted with the same Joseph that they had sold. Of course, now, as viceroy, as governor over the land. In chapters 42 to 45, the biblical story reports the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams. In chapter 42, for instance, we see that Joseph is now leader of Egypt and his own brothers bowed down before him without knowing who he is. 
in chapter 43, Joseph's brothers humble themselves when Joseph forces them to return with Benjamin, his own brother. In chapter 44, when Benjamin's safety becomes their fear, the brothers' fear, they feel threatened. The brothers feel threatened. And they plead for grace before this powerful man whom they see as just like Pharaoh. In the end, when Joseph reveals his identity to the brothers, they begin to understand that despite what they had done to Joseph, God has brought good out of it all, as we read in Genesis chapter 45. So then the story of Joseph's encounter with his brothers highlights four main themes. The first is the fulfillment of Joseph's dream. Joseph's dreams are fulfilled during the three journeys with the brothers and eventually with dad. But it also highlights the suspicion and humiliation of Joseph's brothers. You see, their back and forth journey, journeys from Joseph to their father and the obstacles that they encounter make them remember their wicked acts toward Joseph and towards their father, and they realize that their iniquity toward God. For all purposes, Joseph, Joseph's brothers live during this time the whole experience of a divine judgment. But the story of Joseph's encounter with his brothers also highlights the sincere repentance shown by the brothers. And then the grace and forgiveness awarded to them by Joseph and the Lord. This is expressed in a moving emotional conclusion which brings everybody to tears and joy. It is a message of grace. It is a message of forgiveness for them despite the unjustifiable acts of evil. So this lesson which is such an exciting lesson. I know it is for me, and I know Mark and Danielle, you've told me how exciting this was for you. This lesson focuses on this biblical narrative, this story. And it is not about Joseph. And it's certainly not about the brothers. The happy ending, this story, is not about success. But it is about repentance. It is about forgiveness. And it is about God's grace through his invisible presence and the course of history. Danielle, describe how, how, how Joseph rose to power. Um, so the Sunday's lesson, Joseph's rise to power, uh, I, look, I, I think about it more like a rocket launch, but even that, shh. It's not quite accurate. It's more like a space transponder. You like take him from here and transport him over here. It's, it seems that way, but we'll see why in some ways it wasn't mm -hmm. really like that. So let's start reviewing uh, where we're starting. We're starting at the end of chapter 40, beginning of chapter 41, and at the end of chapter 40 finds Joseph in prison two years after he had interpreted the dreams for the baker and the cupbearer, two years have passed, and we know what happened. The promise was not kept, and uh, he's still languishing in prison. But all of a sudden, Genesis 41.1 says, Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. And the, the dream continues from uh, verse 1 through verse 7, but it's going to be repeated by Joseph, so we won't read it at this point in time. Um, and as the dream has happened, he calls his magicians, and he tries to get them to interpret the dream unsuccessfully. So here we go. He's had the dream, and we start in verse 8. Um, now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh 
told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Now that makes us think a little bit of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's story. And at that time, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even remember the dream and he called his magicians and he uh, told them to tell him the dream and interpret it. In this case, it was a little bit easier for the magicians of, in Pharaoh's time. They were told the dream that Pharaoh had, but it didn't seem to make any difference. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry, so the chief um, butler was the one that was in prison and uh, had had his dream interpreted and his dream had come through and he had promised Joseph that he would mention him to Pharaoh. Now, I don't know if I were the butler, I maybe made that promise, but I'm not sure that I'd be very forthcoming in doing that because uh, Joseph was a Hebrew and Hebrews weren't very well seen and I don't know if I'd go to Pharaoh and say this Hebrew interpreted my dream and you should give him some position but anyway he conveniently forgot but now when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody at the house of the captain of the guard both me and the chief baker we each had a dream in one night he and I each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream now there was a young Hebrew man with us there a servant of the captain of the guard and we told him and he interpreted our dream for us to each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to office and he hanged him. So now he's finding himself where he's got an opportunity to share. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. Now, as a Hebrew, he may have had a beard and so on and so forth, but the Egyptians, as we see in all the uh, historical accounts and the drawings and the, the things that we see in historical diggings, they were clean shaven. They did not usually have beards and things of that nature. So he had to be made presentable. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And here's Joseph responding in verse 16. So Gen Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. A couple of things we notice here in this little line. First of all, very important, Joseph gives credit where it's due to God. And he did the same when he interpreted the dreams of the ones in prison. So and in front of Pharaoh, he does the same. But then he uses the customary language that it will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. One of the things that comes to mind, starts becoming as a clear picture to us is that Joseph, he has spent quite a bit of time already in the Egyptian society, in different levels, in Potiphar's house, overseeing the household, and in prison, he has really gotten to learn a lot of the culture and he is using that. We can see already that even though it appears like God's taken him out and putting over here, beforehand God really prepared him. And we'll see some more things that shape up as we read the story, how clearly it becomes that God's purpose for him going through the difficulties that he had gone were for a preparatory nature. Genesis 41 verses 25 to 32 says, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. So he had, he acknowledged that he, those two dreams that Pharaoh had had were one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven ears and the seven good heads are seven ears. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven ears, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven ears of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. I, uh, I would stop for a minute. If I were Pharaoh, I would think God's really paying attention to me. He's giving me a message, and he's giving me a message of salvation. He's giving me a path and a, a way to overcome and oversee. But we'll see that God does not get the credit from Pharaoh. 
Indeed, seven years of great, and Joseph continues, Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will short, shortly bring it to pass. Now here is becoming a lot more clearer how, how powerful God was speaking to Pharaoh uh, and how beautifully uh, Joseph has instructed him in clarity. But continuing in verse 33, he doesn't, uh, Joseph doesn't just give the interpretation and then wait for a miracle to happen or God to do the rest. He comes up with a plan and it says in verse 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, a discerning and wise man, that's an interesting statement. Uh, where else do we find that kind of language in the Bible talking about someone and what does it mean to be a discerning and wise? Obviously, the magicians were not discerning and wise in this matter. It's referring to someone that will be discerning and wise in God's matters. Um, and we see this language used by Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, when Solomon is, going to, is becoming the king and he asks the Lord to give him. What does he do? What does he ask? Therefore... He says, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. And then God responds to Solomon, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. Obviously, the magicians didn't have that kind of uh, ability. So continuing in verses 37 to 44, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such as one as this a man in whom is the Spirit of God? He understood. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck, and he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And then they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no man may live his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. He established his authority. Without all those steps, uh, his authority would not be established. More than that, he gave him a new name in the verses 45 to 46. I'm going to paraphrase. Zapnath Pane, which means the God speaks that we may live. He also gave him an Egyptian wife who was the daughter of um, the high priest of Egypt, also establishing further his authority because now he through marriage like we've seen so many times in history where authority is established through relationships and marriages and then we see him in action now in seven plentiful years the ground brought forth in verse 47 to 52 so he gathered up the food in seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities he laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them and so on and so forth Basically, what he did is he told them, I'm going to keep one out of fifth of the grains, which means 20%. He established like a tax of 20%. And God had blessed him. Now, in summary and closing, I like to just point out the fact that he could only do what this because God had prepared him already in Potiphar's house, in overseeing the prison. His acumen for organization had come up at that time. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. In interesting that uh, introduction to Sunday.
Joseph is now viceroy, he's governor of Egypt. And his brothers are about to come. Mm -hmm. So Mark, tell us what it was like for Joseph and his brothers to confront sure, each other. Yeah. Wow, what a rocket ship uh, going from a prisoner all the way to the Lord of the, exactly. the effective Lord of the land. Exactly. We have, today we're going to learn about how Joseph um, shows patience and a reliance on God in extreme temptation. And I'm going to talk about temptation for revenge. And we'll also saw, see about how Joseph's brothers also acknowledge that they have sinned. Let's start it out. Um, let's go right into the text. Um, we'll go to chapter uh, 42 in Genesis, verses 1 through 5, and, and start reading the text here. And, and, and really we find that Jacob is the one that sends the brothers to Egypt, the father. So, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, Lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. It's curious how even now, after 20 years, Jacob is still showing favorites among the brothers. And you can see that, I mean, we kind of learn a last lesson. Mm -hmm. Really kind of the start of that jealousy with Jacob was the fact that mm -hmm. he was showing so much um, kind of favorite with Joseph. Mm -hmm. And he's doing the same thing with his, his, his little brother, Benjamin. But let's keep going. Um, we'll go to chapter 42, verses 6 through 8. Now Joseph was governor over the land, as we learned, and and it was he who sold all the people of the people sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces on the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. And then he said to them, "Where do you come from?" And they said, "From the land of Canaan to buy food." So Joseph recognized his brothers. And they did not recognize him. Probably because he had shaved face and he was a little older. Amazing that they recognized his sons and, and uh, his, his brothers at this point. You can imagine the type of feelings and emotions, at least I can, that Joseph must have had at that time. Anger. Rev possibly the, the, the need to do revenge. Mm -hmm mistrustworthiness, there's his brothers, are they the same people as they were before? Mm -hmm. Love, love of his father, all these things. And really, he could have done anything with the brothers. Mm -hmm. He had his options, and he did. He, he kept his options open, and we're going to read about what he did about this. But he kept it, but he could have done anything. But let's, let's, in fact, one of the things that we see right away when they come down and bow up and for him, he also gets a message from God, because 20 years earlier there, he had a dream. Uh, in Joseph 37, verses 7, he had a dream. It says, there we, and he tells his brothers this at the time. They didn't like it, but they tells his brother at the time. On Joseph, I mean, Genesis 37, verses 7, it says, there we were, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. So you can imagine he's also thinking this, but that maybe that's a clue, and God's telling him, Let's be patient. And this is the one thing I think of. It, it, when you, someone has severely hurt you, harmed you, you're in a position of immense power. What kind of temptation you would have to make that revenge? Joseph didn't do that. And let's read on what he did, though. Joseph 40, he wasn't like Christ, though. Not exactly, no. Joseph 42, verses 13 through 17, he says, And they said, Your servants, your servants are brothers and the sons of one man, in the land of Canaan, and in, the, and in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you. Let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, 
surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. So he wasn't, he didn't forgive them then, no. But what I say he's doing, he's showing patience. He said, let's, okay, I'm going to keep my options open on this thing. We'll put him in jail. It's just pretty harsh, but it, he didn't, he didn't do anything permanent, right? He let that three days happen. And after three days, okay, he comes back and he says this to them. Joseph 42, verses 18 and 20. Then Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you, you go and carry grain from the famine of your house and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. So he was listening to God. It wasn't perfect, you know, he wasn't a perfect answer. It was not, he hadn't forgiven them. He was testing them. In fact, you could say he was testing God at this time. Okay, let's read on. Verses 42, verses 21 and 24. And they said to one another, but we're going to learn how they've also are growing. These brothers are growing in chapters 42, verses 21 and 24. And they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. And they're talking about Joseph here. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he was pleading with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distrust has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against this boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked to them, and he took Simon from them and bound him before their eyes. So we do hear that, you know, his brothers are learning. They're different people. And Joseph is learning this thing, but clearly he see the emotional turmoil that Joseph is happening here. And he sends them away. He, but he doesn't send them away. Fear. He sends, we'll learn about what else he does. He sends them away. He keeps Simon with him. Okay. Let's read about Joseph 27. And, uh, I mean, not Joseph, Genesis 42, verses 27 and 28. And it, um, and uh, let me, me, sorry, uh, Genesis 42, uh, verses 27 and 28. This is not in my book. But one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, and he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of his sack. And so he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done for us? They got all the grain, and actually Joseph gave them all the money back. He said, okay, we, we are doing this, but he wants to trust them. I, he wants to trust God. You see that, you see this happening. It's not all bad. It's a process. And, in, and we're going to finish up with Genesis 42, verses 35 to 38. And then it happened that they emptied their sacks, and that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in the sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simon is no more. Of course, Joseph has him now. And you want to take Benjamin of all things against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Bring him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, and this is Jacob saying, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. He is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you will bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Clearly, Jacob hasn't, he's still holding on to Benjamin with all his, all his might. But we see here the nature of Reuben. We see the nature of the uh, Joseph's sons are changing. Here right. Reuben is saying, kill my sons if, if I don't come right, back. Right, right. When we are struggling with temptation, not to forgive, for revenge, keep right. God at your heart and right. listen. And that's what we hear today, I think, what Joseph is saying. And when we have hurt one another, what we're learning from the brothers is to acknowledge your faults. Bring this humiliation to the Lord. And we're going to see that Reuben's proposal to his father ultimately wins out. And we're going to see uh, through Jacob's stronghold. Because Jacob also has a stronghold of grab, holding on to something so precious in favor, to favor Benjamin among all his sons. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And it's an incredible journey. 
they were being tested. Their character was being tested. Yeah, yeah. They, their maturity with God was being tested. They were being tested by his own brother, Joseph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was an amazing, amazing time. Well, Tuesday's lesson is really a meeting between Joseph and Benjamin. How significant that is. How really significant that is. You see, as the regional drought continued, and the supply of grain that had been brought from Egypt was nearly exhausted, Jacob and his sons knew that they would have to return to Egypt to acquire additional food, additional grain. This was a difficult time for the family, not only the brothers, but Joseph. The sons of Jacob knew that they could not return to Egypt without Benjamin, and Jacob could not easily allow the departure of Benjamin uh, the only son from his beloved Rachel that remained, seeing that he thought Joseph was dead. And so J Jacob was af afraid that he would lose him, and I'm talking about Benjamin, as he already had lost Joseph. As we read in Scripture, it was only when there was no more food in the household and when Judah pledged to guarantee the return of Benjamin, that Jacob finally consented to a second visit to Egypt and allowed Benjamin to go with his brothers. Let, let's read what Scripture says. Genesis chapter 43, verses 2, verses 8, and verses 9. Genesis 43, 2, 8, and 9. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father, we're talking about Jacob, said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. Verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me. He's talking about Benjamin. And we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you, dad, and also our little ones. And then verse 9. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Strong words, strong words. So Jacob told his sons to prepare for the journey. He told them to take a present for the ruler. He also told them to take twice as much money with them. The money that had been returned, plus another lot of money to buy the additional grain. And then he said, take also your brother Benjamin with him. And we know that he prayed before they left. He asked for God's mercy for the return of both Judah and Benjamin. And so Jacob's children left on their second journey to Egypt. And upon their arrival... As Joseph's eye fell upon John, uh, Benjamin, his own brother, his own mother's son, Joseph was deeply moved. moved. You know, Genesis chapter 43, verses 29 tells us, Then Joseph lifted up his eyes, or lifted his eyes, and saw his brother Jan, Benjamin, his mother's son, says the Bible. And he asked, Is this your younger brother, of whom you spoke to me? Then turning to Benjamin, as he was looking to Benjamin, then he said to Benjamin, God be gracious to you, my son. Ooh, that's a powerful statement. It's the statement of great affinity and love. Verses 30 and 31, and I'm not going to read those, of Genesis 43, tells us that immediately Joseph was overpowered by feelings of tenderness and could not say anything else, and so he returned to his private quarters and wept there. Joseph is deeply moved by Benjamin's presence. Our lesson asks us a question, and it's a very good question, and I want to uh, really conclude Tuesday by devoting time to unpacking that question and answering the, that question. And the question is, so what effect did Benjamin's presence have on Joseph and the course of the events that followed? Well, as we read the chapter, and we're talking about chapter 43, 
even chapters 41 to 45, and understand the sequence of events, one noticed that Benjamin, Benjamin's presence dominates the events, number one, and number two, that Joseph shows special affected affection towards, towards Benjamin. So notice how Joseph interacts with Benjamin. Chapter 43, verses 16, uh, chapters, Genesis 43, verses 16, tells us when Joseph saw Benjamin with all his brothers, all his brothers standing before Joseph, Benjamin had his eyes totally on Joseph. In other words, Benjamin is the only person whom Joseph really looked at with a certain amount of intensity. In verses 49 of chapter 43, we see that Benjamin is the only one that Joseph calls brother. The verse tells us, in verse 29, then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother, Benjamin, his mother's son. As we read verses 16 and 29 of chapter 43, Joseph calls Benjamin by name. While all the other brothers are not identified, jo Joseph simply refers to the other brothers as men. Men come together and let's have, and let's have a banquet. But with Benjamin, he called him Benjamin. He called him my son. This shows how Benjamin dominated the events of the day. Now, Joseph shows special affection towards Benjamin. Genesis chapter 43, verses 29, and we've already read that. We see that Joseph calls Benjamin, my son. Here is what it says. And Joseph said, God be gracious to you, my son. By the way, this expression is an expression of affection. And it is a very similar to the expression that Abraham um, uh, provided to Isaac when Isaac wanted to know where was the lamb for the sacrifice. And so if you go with me to Genesis chapter 22, verses 8, here's, here's how, uh, how Abraham answered Isaac. My son, says Abraham, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. This love, this affection, this agape love and affection that was uh, shown by Abraham to Isaac is the same, the, the same one that, that Joseph shows it to Benjamin. Well, his affection to Benjamin continues. In Genesis chapter 43, verses 29, Joseph blesses Benjamin as, as he tells him, God be gracious to you, my son. What a contrast. Just 20 years before, Joseph was pleading and begging his brothers for grace and mercy. He pleaded for grace, grace that was not forthcoming. As Joseph blessed Benjamin, he returns to Benjamin, the grace that he did not receive from his other brothers. Jesus has done the same for you and for me. When all the brothers are seated at the table to dine with Joseph, it is Benjamin the youngest who is served five times more than all the others, or all the other brothers. Here is what the Bible says in Genesis 43, verses 33 to 34. And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took uh, servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as uh, any of the others. So they drank and they were merry with him. It is remarkable to see that Joseph, Joseph's favoritism towards Benjamin does not bother his brothers. Unlike many years before when Joseph was his father's favorite son, and this jealousy led to their terrible action towards Joseph and their own fathers. So in conclusion, what effect did Benjamin's presence have on Joseph and the course of events that followed? Now Joseph's brothers feared that they would be cast in prison. 
because of the money that was returned. Just as they were in prison for three days during their first journey. Yet because Benjamin is present and because Joseph is reunited with his own brother Benjamin, he prepares a banquet for them instead. Benjamin, his presence has a redeeming effect on the whole situation. You see, in this particular time with the brothers, forgiveness and repentance. So Daniel, divination, this is a great word, Divination cup. The divination cup. The cup of Joseph is placed in one bag. Whose bag is it? What does this all mean? So, the story continues. <laughs> As they're about to go home, and we see in uh, chapter 44, starting with verse 1, that Joseph, and he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to what that Joseph had spoken. Now, so far, we are not really describing it's just a silver cup, but we'll get some more of a description and we'll discuss it then. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. Now what's a divination cup to us? Not much. <laughs> it's just a strange word. But really to them, especially in their Egyptian culture, we have to remember that we, the opening scenes that we've had at the beginning of the lessons were where the magicians were called and magicians were um, practicing divinations and all these uh, gods and different religions and they communicated with the gods and also used them for decision making in the high rankings of this culture. Uh, now we know that by now Joseph is above all of them, second in command to Pharaoh, above all the magicians. Uh, from you know, Whether he did divination or not, it doesn't matter, but they probably thought that he is quite some magician <laughs> based on what he's just done. Not too long ago, like by now it's like four, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Of 14 years they've seen him at work and on account of his great wisdom they probably thought he did practice magic. Um, the divination cup could be used for different things. Uh, it was a silver cup and it was also used to detect like when they ate something they would use it to detect uh, poison. Um, they would also practice divination uh, and so on and so forth. Now it, the meaning in our story is the fact that it was an important cup. It wasn't just a routine, um, meaningless cup. So that's, that's a big theft that could be severely punished has been done. So here we go, the story in verse 6 continuing. So he overtook them and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants could do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan and the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from our Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we will also will be my Lord's slaves. Mm -hmm. I'll be very careful saying those kind of words after you've, I mean, they've experienced already going, getting home with the money in their bags. Things went unusual the first time. I wouldn't be so cavalier, but anyway. And he said in verse 10, now also let it be according to your words, he with whom it is found shall be my slave and you shall be blameless. In other words, I don't want all of you, we'll just only take the one that stole. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground and each opened his sack, so he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest and the cup was found in dun, 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 Benjamin's sack. <laughs> 
And sure enough, now we, we can see already how thorough and careful and calculating Joseph has been. He has been thinking over this story for years. And probably since they left to go back home and until they came back, he has come up with this plan. Because it wasn't, he wasn't about to just let them go and not finish the story. Then they tore their clothes and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what did is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Now, why would he ask them that? Obviously, they're not magicians, Egyptians, but his fame has spread. I mean, all the surrounding countries knew what happened in Egypt. His story wasn't just, it was probably on all the news for the last 14 years, especially in the last seven when things were going bad and people were going there to buy food. His fame had gone through. Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? We can see Judah right here. Now, who is Judah? Judah was the brother that when Joseph was put in the pit mm -hmm. and the traders, mm -hmm. the merchants came by, mm -hmm. Judah was the one that came up with the idea, mm -hmm. let's sell him. And he was the one that so eloquently spoke to his brothers and convinced his brothers to sell him off to the merchants. And this is Judah. So I imagine Joseph's feelings and thoughts as he's listening to this particular brother talking. And we can see that Judah's right here. What does it sound like? Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found the iniquity of your servants. Mm -hmm. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, mm -hmm. both we and he also with whom the cup was found. We're yours. It's like the Lord, he is, Judah is a convicted man by the Lord. Mm -hmm. he, he is not saying clearly why he is at fault, but he's realizing he's at fault and it's coming back to haunt him and God's, um, God's really reprimanding him. That's how he looks at it. And, and his total submission, and he's talking to a foreigner, mm -hmm. yet he is completely given him because he's talking to a foreigner, but he's also talking to God. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. This is Joseph saying, the man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. And here comes the test from Joseph. He's basically going to save his brother. And, you know, he's not sold on what his brothers were changed, that they are changed men. Not yet. But Judah intercedes for Benjamin in verse 18. Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant for you are even like Pharaoh. You're like all powerful. You can do anything to us, but just hear us, hear me. My Lord asked his servant saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a brother, an old man and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead and he alone is left of his mother's children and his father loves him he's talking with all his heart and all honesty and Joseph knows every bit of it there's no question in what he's hearing then you said to your servants bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him and we said to my Lord the lad cannot leave his father for if he should leave his father his father would die but you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And in verse 25, and our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons and the one went out from me and I said, surely he's torn to pieces. He's talking about Joseph. And I have not seen him since, but if you take this one also from me and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servant will break. To make a long story short, 
he basically says, I'm going to stay in his place. I'm going to be your servant forever. You can do with me whatever you'd like. Just let him go. And Joseph sees truthfully how repentant he was. And it's very reminiscent of the text in Romans 5 with 8 when it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he, he was willing to die for his brother. Thank you, Daniel. Humiliation, repentance, and then comes forgiveness. Mark, Joseph introduces himself to his brothers. How significant was that? Yeah, it was a big point. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. this is the, we're going to, you know, we've, we've listened to this really incredible story of, right. of of gifts that Joseph has seen, but on the same hand, now he's seeing his brothers and having to forgive, and then all the tests that he's done through Jesus. He's still testing the Lord, but let's see. After this last, um, yes. Yes. last yes. test, which is a big test, let's read right away in Joseph 45 verses one through three what Joseph said. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Joseph was done with all the tests. He finally, in my mind, he was testing. Joseph, even at this point, was testing the Lord. Until this point, he was testing the Lord. He's done with all those tests. He gave it to God. And you can imagine when he did that, he wept with, with one, I mean, I don't know, of joy, um, with acceptance. I mean, I can just imagine. I get emotional just thinking about it right here. God had given him everything. He'd given him two sons. He'd given him a good life prophetic dreams coming true. But it wasn't until this point that Joseph was not sure, could not believe his brothers had changed. And now we see that Jodah would give up his freedom for Benjamin. And that was that turning point for him, you know, among the other things, I think. Let's read on. Let's read on in, in Genesis 45, verses 4 through 8, more of this incredible story. And then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near, and then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives with great deliverance. So now it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And we see this. Joseph does not blame his brothers. He realizes at this point that God has sent him there to preserve life, not only his brother's lives, but the, the thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of peoples of the Egyptians that would have starved if, if his planning hadn't been enacted. You know, and this is, a, if you kind of look at it, I've, I've been learning about Pastor Joseph's uh, uh, kind of chiastic structure, and this is a chiastic structure too that's in the Bible. Um, it's, it's Joseph's story of the chiastic structure. It's not the whole chiastic structure. What it is is that we've read over his story, Joseph's life, but this actually is the pinnacle point that, that where you kind of rise up, there's a pinnacle, and then there's a parallel structure that goes down. This is that structure where at the top, we learn that pinnacle moment that God saves us. And Ellen White, and you can almost see this is very, very much like a pre-Jesus in the, in the Bible. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 239, the life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave. And they hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they would be no more troubled with his dreams, that they had removed all the possibility of their fulfillment. But th their own course was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. The Jewish priests and elders 
were jealous of Christ, fearing that he, you know, would attract the attention of people from everywhere, so they tried to put him to death to prevent him, they did put him to death, to prevent him from becoming the king. But they were thus bringing about that very result, Jesus as king. Joseph, Genesis 45 verses 9 through 4, uh, 14 also talks more about this story. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Joseph and Joseph, and you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have, and I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have came to poverty. For there are still more five years of famine. And it will go down. I'm going to jump down to verse 14, and it says, And he and he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. The brothers are realizing that this is Joseph, the one that they thought was lost, that they had, you know, the, the, the brother that they had made grievous, you know, ish, uh, sins against. And here they've come together, and you can see this, this wonderful scene here, okay? The brothers also believed, too. They didn't believe in him. Okay, but they are now, they were, they were worried about him because he was Lord of the land, but they see his brothers. And now we're going to see um, um, Joseph's proof that he truly trusts the Lord. Because in verses 45, verses 21 and, 40, 20, 21 and 24, what does he do? He sends all the brothers back home to collect the father. Exactly. He doesn't keep anybody here. There's nothing there. They could have stayed there. Okay, he had, to, he fully trusts. You see him fully trusting the Lord here, sending them all back to Egypt. There was trust in Joseph to send his brothers away. Fully trust the Lord. Okay, and um, they sold it. Now their brothers, and uh, the brothers had to get there. They had one more act of humiliation, as Ellen White uh, talks about in Patriarchs and Prophets. They had to tell, oh, they, it, was a, it was wonderful news to tell about Joseph, but they also, as Ellen White says, also had to confess to their father the deceit and cruelty for so many years had embittered his life and theirs. Jacob was not suspecting of them of so base a sin, but he said that all had been overruled for good, and he forgave and blessed his earring children. So this is page 232 in uh, Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets. During this whole story, everyone has grown in the story. Joseph has learned to forgive, you see that, and tr fully trust the Lord. Jacob has grown um, and has sh to not show favorites and give faith in the Lord. The sons have humiliated themselves before God, acknowledging their sins to their brother and, the, and their father. Okay. Thanks so much, Mark. Absolutely. Wonderful. Danielle? Any final thoughts from you? Yes. Um, as I was preparing for this lesson, and even as I was listening to all, as you were pre both presenting, things that came clear to me was looking over Joseph's lives in this lesson during the terrible and awful times in his life. We could see God's hand at work protecting him and using slavery and events that just seemed to us incomprehensible to develop him and make him into the person that he was being. It's being sold first to the merchants and then in Potiphar's household, developing skills and knowledge that he needed to have both of the local customs and of how to oversee and overrun and direct and guide, how his character was tested so that he could solidify his decisions to follow God no matter what. And then it, even in prison, similarly, he learned further it was like run number two, yeah. uh, training number two, uh, so that he could eventually graduate to being second in command over a whole country. And not only Egypt, Egypt's population, but all the surrounding nations, mm -hmm. saving the surrounding nations. It made me think of our lives, and when we think that the horrible things that sometimes happen to us, we think, what could God be thinking? Well. Joseph probably thought that many a time in his life. But God, just as he worked in Joseph's life, works in our lives. And sometimes the greater the test, the greater the acumen that's developed on us, the greater character building, so that God could entrust us with bigger 
and better things that he has in mind for us to do. So we must always keep that in mind because the story is not complete till we'll be in heaven and know it in detail. Amen. Amen. Mark, yeah, final so, words for me? Um, wonderful, awesome story. Um, you know, a story of distrust, mistrust, jealousy, ultimately, that, but really ultimately a story that that reinforces our need to continue to follow God. By doing that, we can be blessed. We can learn to forgive those that transgress against us, no matter how egregious the event. We can recover from hurt that's shown us. And ultimately, through that relationship with Jesus, we can continue to grow um, greater and greater every day. Thank you, Mark. This is an incredible story. You know, I, I, I can just go back into, this, into the, the story, this journey that we've been on into the Sabbath school. And when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, <laughs> when he actually says who he is, that he becomes like a family member to his brothers again. Mm -hmm. When Jesus comes into the heart and we recognize and, and, and see that Jesus reveals himself to each one of us, anything that we are about becomes insignificant as we accept Jesus into our lives. It's an incredible story. It's an in, a story of repentance, it's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of love and restoration. It's a story of grace. And in every aspect of the relationship between Joseph and his brothers, you can see Jesus in that pathway, Amen. leading yep. the way. Amen. So my appeal to you and to me is that we open the heart, our heart to the Lord, that the Lord may come and abide within, so that as He is revealed to each one of us on the cross and as our Lord and Redeemer, that we may just set all selfish things aside and through His forgiveness embrace Him, through the shed of blood be cleansed and as we embrace him there is that unity of spirit that wholeness that comes by we become his and he is ours so let's pray gracious heavenly father i am so pleased so pleased lord that scripture reveals who you are and in the story of joseph and the brothers and the encounter that we find in chapters 41 to 45 of Genesis. We see you all throughout. For as, El as Sister White says, Joseph truly was purely a form of who you are in his dealings with his brother. Lord, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that you were prepared to be sold, that you were prepared to die, that you were prepared to, pl to, to pay the price so that we could have forgiveness, so that you could accept us, so that we could really be restored and renewed. And then, Lord, celebrate happiness in a banquet which is soon to come when you take us back to heaven. I want to thank you, O oh Lord, not only for this story, but for your amazing grace. Give us a wonderful Sabbath. Lord, keep holding on to us. And Father, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, may our characters be changed so that we may truly be able to reflect you your love and your light and your truth in our homes, in the workplace that we, ab that we abode every day, and in the marketplace. We thank you, Father, for your amazing grace, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.